All right. So for those of you who believe that tumor heterogeneity is a novel concept, I take you back about 120 years. One of the great physicians, Sir William Osler, said, if it were not for the great variability among individuals, medicine might as well be a science, not an art. And I think we accept that today, certainly in oncology, as one of the bases for what we do. It also tells us that we really rarely discover anything on our own, that we all stand on the shoulders of giants and we just build on their accomplishments. So things are starting to change. And um, I think things are starting to change already in the clinical use of uh, these novel concepts, um, a result of translational research. So uh, translational research has as objectives of personalized medicine uh, to deliver the treatments with the highest probability of anti-tumor effects, the lowest risk of toxicity, to individual patients based on the characteristics of their tumor and the genetic profile of the host. And I think both of these latter aspects are critically important to bring together in order to translate what we know into optimal therapy. Now this starts by the assessment of risk of recurrence. And we have made <clears throat> pretty large strides in this process from the classical histopathological prognostic factors to single molecular markers, um, such as, I don't know if this works, uh, such as those shown in the middle column, to the development of multifactorial prognostic indices, and more recently, the development of gene expression profiles, proteomic profiles, and more importantly, perhaps, not prognostic, but predictive profiles. That is to say, to determine whether someone, an individual patient, is more or less likely to benefit from a therapeutic intervention. Uh, three or four decades of work are summarized on this slide. And in terms of adjuvant systemic therapy of primary breast cancer, you can estimate that optimal endocrine therapy would reduce annual odds of death by about 60 to 70 percent. Uh, chemotherapy would do the same thing at about 50 to 60 percent of patients. Trastuzumab, about 50 percent. And zoledronic acid, at least in a couple of trials, by about a third. Reductions in odds of mortality are somewhat more modest than this for a variety of statistical and uh, natural history reasons. So the big question is whether all patients benefit equally or there are some subsets of patients who benefit more and others less or not at all. This is by now a classical um, uh, work and it represents a watershed event um, in the history of uh, uh, certainly of breast cancer and similar figures can be found in other tumor types. And it is the work of the Stanford group at that time with uh, uh, Chuck Peru, um, looking at gene expression profiles and the identification of uh, molecular subsets of breast cancer based on clustering uh, like with like. And as you can see on this slide, there are about five different uh, subsets. Uh, it is uncertain whether the real figure is four or 10 or 20. I suspect the number will increase as we learn more about them. And in addition to clustering individuals with similar molecular characteristics in their tumors, this has prognostic importance as shown on the right of this slide, since different uh, subgroups have different uh, survival experience uh, based on their uh, molecular characteristics. Now, this is just one of many such classifications. And one can, by um, gene expression profiling, 
by proteomics, by glycomics, metabolomics, and many other omics, can develop prognostic profiles that will result in similar division of the overall group of breast cancers. And I think the, the most important message of this is that breast cancer is not a single disease. Breast cancer, like lung cancer, like leukemias, like uh, lymphomas, is a conglomerate of multiple molecularly characterized uh, subsets that have different natural histories, different molecular characteristics, sensitivities to therapy, and therefore need to be considered individually. Now, this is just a, a summary of a number of molecular signatures that have uh, been uh, referred to repeatedly, and some of them have had clinical validation to a certain extent. The two, the two top ones, the MAMAPRINT and Oncotype DX, are probably the most advanced in their um, uh, clinical validation. Both of them have undergone or are undergoing large prospective phase three trials to determine their usefulness in the selection of therapies for patients. The Taylor X trial uh, was uh, conducted in uh, 11,000 patients with no negative estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. The Responder trial was just uh, activated earlier this year. It will recruit 9,400 patients, all of them characterized by the Oncotype DX. Uh, you know about the MINDEC trial, which is currently accruing patients. The point of this slide is that each of these profiles or molecular signatures can determine various molecular subsets and prognostic subsets of breast cancer, and some of them appear to predict benefit from specific interventions. This is another uh, uh, list that shows that these various profiles can identify different prognostic subsets. What is interesting of this is that this ability to identify prognostic subsets is almost independent of the composition of each profile. These profiles have anywhere from two to uh, about a hundred different genes, most of them non-overlapping between the different profiles, and yet they have a similar ability to predict outcome. The, as shown on this uh, latest uh, um, the screen, less than, there's less than 5% overlap in the composition of these prognostic profiles. Now, what has happened, uh, and this has been a major conceptual change in how we look at breast cancer, certainly. This is probably true for other solid tumors. When I started in oncology, we looked at the assessment of risk and we determined the type of intervention based on the risk level of individual patients. So at higher risk, we recommended more aggressive therapy. At lower risk, we recommended less aggressive or no therapy. That led in its most uh, uh, absurd uh, uh, example to high-dose chemotherapy and bone marrow transplantation in a disease that probably does not benefit from it. What has changed is the understanding that risk is not equivalent to sensitivity to therapies, and therefore uh, it is much more appropriate to, yes, determine risk to, to understand whether an individual patient uh, would theoretically benefit from additional therapy, but then select that therapy based on potential sensitivity to available agents or treatments. Uh, obviously, there are multiple factors that help in the selection of systemic therapy for primary breast cancer, including the molecular uh, characteristics of the tumor, the risk of recurrence, the potential benefit from treatment, the existence or absence of comorbid conditions, and the toxicities of uh, the leading therapeutic interventions. And this is a complex uh, decision uh, that uh, can be systematized, however. Now, molecular subtyping, as uh, I showed you in an earlier slide, is uh, a lovely research tool. It is not available in most uh, clinical centers. So we have used surrogates for this in uh, the clinical management of breast cancer. 
the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, uh, HER2 uh, expression or amplification, uh, and some measure of proliferation, such as Key67. And these are arguably the most important biomarkers today in breast cancer. Now, this is interesting because in my professional lifetime, there have been probably well over 400 uh, proposed biomarkers in breast cancer, and these are the only four that have been validated. I should ask, uh, I should add that PAI has also been validated, because, but because it requires fresh or frozen tissue, it has not become a practical or widely utilized prognostic or predictive indicator. However, I could not imagine today um, making therapeutic decisions in a patient with breast cancer without having access to this. I think it would be poor practice of medicine. So we use uh, surrogate uh, classifications, recognizing that classification based on, this, on these biomarkers and what I showed you earlier based on um, mRNA microarrays do not overlap completely. In fact, there is a discrepancy in about 25% of patients, and I'll show you some uh, examples of that. Now, <clears throat> these are the four major clinical subtypes of breast cancers that we have identified today uh, based on the biomarkers I showed you in a previous slide. And we tend to treat uh, uh, patients based on this uh, simplistic clinical classification. So let me go through that very quickly, and then I'll um, review briefly where I think the field is taking us. So uh, patients with hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, and low proliferative rate breast cancer, similar to luminal A breast cancer, are treated clearly with endocrine therapy. And it is important for us to understand that based on the best available data, endocrine therapy is as effective and um, usually accepted to be more effective than all other therapeutic interventions today. So this is the critical part of treating luminal A breast cancer, whether in the primary or the metastatic setting. Now, good science always leads to more questions than answers, and the lower part of this slide has just some of the leading questions that we will need to address in future clinical trials or laboratory experiments. This is premenopausal women, a similar list of uh, optimal treatments and outstanding questions exist for postmenopausal women who that represent about 75% of patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Now, chemotherapy also has a role in uh, uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancer, but it is as, a, as an adjuvant to, as in addition to endocrine therapy. And it is considered that the standard of care is the sequential administration of chemotherapy followed by endocrine therapy in the primary uh, situation. In the metastatic setting, we usually exhaust all endocrine therapy before turning to cytotoxic treatment. Now, retrospective analysis suggests that not all patients with hormone receptor positive breast cancer benefit from chemotherapy and that those with the, the highest expression of hormone receptors, especially those with low grade and low proliferative rate tumors tend to benefit little or not from chemotherapy. More recently, uh, tests such as the Oncotype DX have also um, divided the hormone receptor positive group into those with a greater or smaller a likelihood of benefit from chemotherapy. So you know that the Oncotype DX uh, assay consists of 21 genes measured by RT-PCR, and uh, at the end of uh, a complex um, a statistical uh, calculation, a numerical risk uh, score or recurrence score is given, with low risk being under 18, high risk being uh, over 31, an intermediate risk in between. Now, um, if you look at hormone receptor positive node negative breast cancer, about 7% will turn out to be, uh, correction, about half will turn out to have low recurrence risk, recurrence score, 
and about a quarter um, each for intermediate and high recurrence score. The 10-year predicted recurrence rate for these groups are 7, 14, and 30 percent, respectively, and these differences are uh, highly significant. Now, if you look at, um, if you apply the recurrence score to retrospectively to patients treated in a clinical trial, in this case, a randomization between no additional treatment and five years of tamoxifen, you will see that there is a, a significant benefit for, uh, from tamoxifen for patients with low recurrence score, a, um, a similar benefit for those with intermediate recurrence score, but despite having estrogen receptor or progesterone receptor expression, those with high recurrence score do not seem to benefit from the administration of endocrine therapy. Now, we have not had the intestinal fortitude to ask this question prospectively in a randomized trial, but since these represent 50% of patients, and since five years of either tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor are not innocuous, I think at some point in time we will need to consider that. How about the prediction of chemotherapy benefit? This is from another prospective randomized trial. And you will note that on the upper left part of this slide, those patients with low risk do not seem to benefit from the addition of chemotherapy to five years of tamoxifen. Uh, neither do those with intermediate risk, whereas those with high risk have an, an inordinate benefit, uh, much higher than predicted, with a hazard ratio of, I believe, something like 0.34. From mostly from CMF chemotherapy. So these are sort of initial steps suggesting that there may be ways to identify hormone receptor positive tumors that either do or do not benefit from endocrine therapy or do or do not benefit from chemotherapy. There are ongoing trials validating these concepts. So to summarize what we have learned about the Oncotype DX assay, um, patients with low or intermediate recurrence score seem to benefit from tamoxifen. Those with high recurrence score do not. Conversely, patients with high recurrence score seem to benefit from chemotherapy, whether CMF or CAF, and those with low or intermediate probably do not. And these retrospective observations apply not only to lymph node negative, but also to lymph node positive breast cancer data that I did not show you. The recently activated responder trial in the North American cooperative group system addresses this question specifically in hormone receptor positive lymph node positive breast cancer. Now, <clears throat> Another important question in the hormone receptor positive group of patients uh, is whether, whether interfering with more than one um, growth factor pathway is of uh, benefit to these patients. Now, on this slide, I show you uh, three, actually four different clinical trials. These are all in the metastatic setting. And what they have in common is that they combine an endocrine treatment, either an AI or tamoxifen, with a growth factor inhibitor, either against uh, EGFR or HER1 or against HER2. And essentially all four of these, while they are relatively under um, uh, powered trials with the exception of uh, the Johnston trial, uh, they show an advantage for the combination. So I think these are leads that uh, explain and confirm what has been observed in preclinical systems, preclinical models in several different labs. And I think we need to follow up on these because uh, clearly while these combinations are not completely non-toxic, they are less toxic that, than combinations of chemotherapy and endocrine therapy. So this is a model in which the mechanisms of resistance to endocrine therapy start to emerge. So um, at the bottom of the slide is the estrogen receptor uh, uh, gene, and on the top part you see the various ways of activating the estrogen receptor. 
The most common one is through the natural ligand estrogen, which uh, enters the cell, um, binds to the estrogen receptor, activates the estrogen receptor, and all um, um, downstream activities, which consist on a modulation of about 800 different genes. So this is a very complex uh, biological phenomenon. And you can, of course, uh, uh, inhibit this by using antiestrogens such as tamoxifen, by decreasing the natural ligand through the use of oophorectomy or an aromatase inhibitor. You can also activate the estrogen receptor in the absence of the natural ligand by activation of other cell surface growth factor uh, systems, such as the IGF-1R, uh, the HER group of, uh, of uh, receptors. Uh, in each of these, in the case of overexpression or amplification, or some other way of activation, will result in activation of the estrogen receptor complex. Now, um, you can imagine that if the estrogen receptor is activated through one of these uh, ancillary uh, methods of activation, the use of antiestrogens or an aromatase inhibitor is unlikely to work. And uh, here is where the concept of blocking two parallel and complementary uh, uh, signaling systems has arisen. Now, it's our, our lab, our group, has worked a lot with the, the PI3 kinase signaling pathway, uh, starting with the PIK3CA and all the way down to mTOR, about which you've heard uh, a lot today. And this is a summary slide that shows that uh, approximately 15% uh, or 13% of breast cancers uh, have um, uh, abnormalities of the catalytic domain of PIK3CA. Uh, what is important, uh, however, is that if you look at the second line where it says hormone receptor positive, uh, more than 20% of breast cancers have mutations. And uh, if you add to that other forms of activation of, uh, of this pathway, then this is arguably the most frequently dysregulated signaling pathway in breast cancer. And I think that makes it one of the prime candidates for developing therapeutic interventions, both alone and in combination with inhibition of complementary pathways. Now, one of those trials is, uh, is the Bolero 2 trial, which will be reported uh, in a couple of weeks in, at ESMO. And in this trial, we take advantage of the therapeutic effect of an mTOR inhibitor, in this case, Everolimus, added to exemestane, which is an aromatase inhibitor, in patients who have uh, developed progressive disease in the metastatic setting after being treated with a first-line aromatase inhibitor, such as letrozole or anastrozole. And this is compared in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial to exemestane and placebo. The primary efficacy variable of this was progression-free survival with the secondary endpoints shown below. Now, uh, earlier this year, uh, you all saw the, the press release of the sponsor in which uh, this uh, particular um, a clinical trial had more than reached all primary and secondary efficacy variables uh, for which the data was mature enough. I will only show you one slide uh, just to give you an idea that the hazard ratio was 0.43, and this is a very highly significant um, advantage for this group. So this is uh, a proof of concept. There are multiple other trials uh, following this concept that are in course in recruiting patients. So I think we have started to take the first steps towards uh, doublets and perhaps triplets in the hormone receptor positive breast cancer. And as several of the previous speakers have pointed out today, that is the majority of breast cancers. And while we think of triple negative and HER2 positive breast cancer as being the greatest threat to women's life, it is the luminal A and B breast cancer that is. That's where the greatest number of deaths from breast cancer occur. Now let's talk about the HER2 positive breast cancer. Um, the HER family, if you remember, consists of four um, homologous uh, cell surface receptors, HER1 through 4. HER1 is also known as EGFR. 
And uh, over the past 20 years, there has been an explosion of our understanding of the basic biology of this subset of breast cancer and a parallel explosion in the development of therapeutics. Uh, trastuzumab and lapatinib are clearly the most advanced in clinical development, but there's a, the list on the left side of the slide shows this is just the tip of the iceberg, and we have made more progress in this subtype of breast cancer than all other subtypes of breast cancer. This used to be the worst prognostic subgroup of breast cancers, and today it matches in outcome the, uh, the hormone receptor positive breast cancer, both in the metastatic and in the primary cell. Setting. So this has been a true therapeutic revolution. Now, uh, this slide um, uh, summarizes the work of multiple groups around the world uh, with uh, five of the six um, clinical trials in the adjuvant setting utilizing trastuzumab. This, is, uh, this represents about 13,000 women with HER2-positive breast cancer. and. Um, as I stated on a much maligned editorial some uh, 18, uh, uh, six years ago, uh, these results are absolutely amazing. Uh, this represents a 50% reduction in odds of recurrence and a 50% reduction in mortality. We are, we are curing a subset of these patients who would have otherwise relapsed. Now, there are, again, many more questions about this than answers, but it is clear that um, these patients need to see either trastuzumab or uh, probably lapatinib during their primary treatment, their primary combined modality treatment with curative intent. And uh, there are multiple ways of administering trastuzumab, and the best evidence today suggests that we need to give it for one year although we need to clearly revisit that concept and, um, and combine it with appropriate chemotherapy and endocrine therapy as uh, indicated by the uh, other uh, prognostic factors. Uh, there is discussion about how in a, in a world where we diagnose primary breast cancer at increasingly earlier stages, what to do with the very small node negative HER2 positive breast cancers. But that's the topic of an entire other hour and I shall not get there. There are four, perhaps five clinical trials looking at the duration of um, the optimal duration of trastuzumab um, although I'm not a betting man, I suspect that uh, the shorter durations will be as effective as the longer ones, but uh, let uh, the clinical trials decide that. The FAIR trial from France has completed accrual, and several of the others are well underway to completing accrual. So within the next four or five years, we should have an answer about this. The um, the, one of the original clinical trials uh, also randomized uh, trastuzumab for one versus two years. That has not been, the two year part has not been reported now uh, six years after the initial analysis of that trial. So I suspect that the number of events and the event rate is so low that we will never be able to document the difference. Now, um, despite this, and despite the marvelous effects of these drugs, obviously only about half of those patients with HER2 positive uh, disease benefit from the, the administration of a, of a HER2 directed treatment. So what happens to the rest? Well, obviously there is uh, inherent resistance to trastuzumab and or lapatinib, and the development of secondary resistance. And there are multiple mechanisms of resistance that we have identified. Uh, Francisco Esteva in my group has worked uh, for the past good many years looking at this particular problem. So one of the, uh, the identified mechanisms of resistance is a disrupted antibody receptor interaction by altered uh, molecular conformation, uh, conformation of the receptor. 
Uh, one mechanism that I don't show on this slide is overgrowth of Mach 1 on the cell surface that hides the, the binding area or the binding domain of the HER2 extracellular domain. There is increased receptor signaling by other HER members or other growth factors such as IGF1R and others. And then there are downstream um, effectors that are activated despite uh, the presence of trastuzumab or lapatinib. And these, all of these are currently under, um, under evaluation and under therapeutic validation. So uh, these are just some of the strategies that are in clinical trials. And we have already completed some of the trials, some of the initial trials to validate these concepts. So again here, the concept of blocking either the same pathway at two different levels or blocking two parallel and complementary pathways to overcome resistance uh, arises. So here too, I show you how um, um, various signaling pathways interfere with, uh, for instance, the effect of trastuzumab. So we have noticed, for instance, that P10 loss results in marked resistance to trastuzumab because the presence and activation of P10 is indispensable for the activity of trastuzumab. Um, there are uh, other effects. For instance, SARC can inhibit the activation of P10. So SARC uh, activation can result indirectly in uh, trastuzumab resistance and so on and so forth. To, to try to overcome this, we have uh, developed a number of strategies. I didn't mention pertuzumab earlier, but pertuzumab is a monoclonal antibody that also binds to the extracellular domain of HER2, and its major action is to interfere with the dimerization, especially the heterodimerization of HER2 with HER3, and thus preventing the initiation of signaling. Now, uh, as this uh, preclinical experiment suggests, the combination of the two antibodies, even though they bind to very closely uh, um, uh, related uh, extracellular domains of, uh, of HER2, the addition of these two antibodies results in at least additive and perhaps synergistic activity. Uh, as I'll show you in this next uh, couple of slides, this has been confirmed in, in clinical trials. The Neosphere study was just reported last December. It is a four-arm randomized neoadjuvant trial in which all patients received some anti-HER2 therapy. Now, um, a T stands for uh, docetaxel or taxotere, and H stands for herceptin or trastuzumab. Notice that um, number one, number two, and number four um, arms receive a combination of chemotherapy plus either uh, trastuzumab or pertuzumab or the combination of the two antibodies. Uh, arm number three in light green does not have chemotherapy in the neoadjuvant setting, just the combination of the two antibodies. Uh, after about four cycles of these treatments, patients were operated and then postoperatively they received uh, what was considered the standard of care so as not to deprive them of the best possible treatment. Now, the results of this trial were very interesting, and uh, no surprise, based on the preclinical experiment I showed you earlier, the most effective uh, arm in terms of pathological complete remission rate was the uh, chemotherapy plus the two antibodies. What is interesting on this slide is not that, but that arm number three, in the absence of chemotherapy, shows a close to 20%, well, 17%, uh, PCR rate in the absence of chemotherapy. So this indicates to me that there is a subset of HER2 positive breast cancers that could be treated were we to develop the appropriate biomarkers in the absence of cytotoxic chemotherapy. And I think this is a very important concept that we need to um, follow up and we need to urgently develop biomarkers to identify patients who do have mechanisms of resistance and those who do not. 
Now, these differences are, of course, highly significant, and I'm not going to get into that. What is also interesting in this study is that there was a difference in the success rate of all of these interventions based on estrogen receptor status. So the HER2, while it is a dominant driving uh, molecular abnormality, is modulated to some extent by the estrogen receptor pathway. And notice that, in the, that the highest pathological complete remission rates were in the estrogen receptor negative group and the lowest in the estrogen receptor positive group. And some of these differences are very dramatic. Notice, for instance, in the combined trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and docetaxel arm, the PCR rate in the ER negative group is 63%, and the ER positive group is 26%. These are huge differences, and obviously, highly statistically significant. And while this is a retrospective analysis, there are other trials that show something very similar. Now, I showed you trastuzumab combined with pertuzumab. On this slide, I show you a, an experiment in which lapatinib, a small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitor that inhibits HER2 activation, uh, is combined with trastuzumab. Again, showing a, the superiority of the combination of the dual HER2 inhibition in a preclinical model. Now, this was also uh, tested in a clinical trial called NeoAlto, which combined paclitaxel with either lapatinib and trastuzumab or the combination of the two anti-HER2 agents. This is also in the neoadjuvant setting with activity measured in pathological complete remission rate. Notice that the PCR rate was highest with the combination uh, of the two uh, uh, anti-HER2 agent. Whether PCR is uh, def defined as no residual disease in the breast or on the right side of the, of the slide, no residual disease in the breast in regional lymph nodes. Um, when analyzed by hormone receptor status, uh, this shows the same uh, results. Notice that for each color, uh, the uh, PCR rate shown on the left for hormone receptor positive breast cancers is significantly lower than uh, those PCR rates shown on the right side for ER negative breast cancer. So this is clearly a, a phenomenon that we need to take into consideration and understand further. A third trial uh, that uh, speaks a little bit to this is uh, the Gepard Quinto trial, which compared the combination of chemotherapy plus trastuzumab to chemotherapy plus lapatinib, showing that a single agent in combination with chemotherapy, trastuzumab, might be somewhat more effective. The caveat in this trial is that lapatinib has much more toxicity than trastuzumab, and it, uh, there were many more discontinuations and dose reductions in the lapatinib arm, so there is no certainty that given at full dose, the two uh, arms would not have been comparable. Now, <clears throat> I showed you the, the importance of the PI3 kinase uh, activation. Um, and in our group, we developed a combination therapy for patients with HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer that had developed progressive disease while receiving a trastuzumab containing regimen. And based on preclinical experiments, we added an mTOR inhibitor, in this case, Everolimus, to trastuzumab in second line therapy. And while this was not a home run, there was clearly activity with a 15% objective response rate and another 20% of stability, and some of uh, stability over 24 weeks or half a year, which is considered um, a significant response to therapy. So um, this was uh, considered a proof of concept. Um, so next, uh, independent investigators initiated a similar trial, but in combination with paclitaxel. Uh, so combining Everolimus or RAD001, trastuzumab and paclitaxel in patients who were progressing or trastuzumab and taxane-resistant breast cancer. 
Um, the best response in 25 evaluable patients was 20% uh, PRs in stable disease in 56%, with uh, some notable toxicities as shown at the, at the bottom. Uh, the waterfall plot shows that actually the majority of these patients had some degree of tumor regression. And remember that all of these patients had progressive disease on a taxane and trastuzumab before the addition of RAD001. So there is something that this combination is doing by interfering with a, par with a downstream signaling pathway that is beneficial and that gives us a signal that this might be even more effective in uh, earlier stages of breast cancer. Now, another example of uh, inhibiting two complementary signaling pathways is the BETH trial. So we know that HER2 amplification also results in uh, overexpression of VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor. And um, that perhaps contributes to the rapid progression of this type of breast cancer. So the BETH trial combined chemotherapy and trastuzumab with bevacizumab, a VEGF inhibitor. Um, this trial is a randomized prospective trial, has completed the accrual of 3,500 patients, and we are expecting for sufficient numbers of events to occur to, uh, for the first analysis to take place. Now let me move to the last subset, the triple negative breast cancer, which is also a very interesting subset. So triple negative breast cancer um, uh, is uh, defined as the absence of uh, um, expression of estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and normal background expression of HER2. Uh, it is uh, very similar to what uh, mRNA expression profiles um, uh, call basal-like breast cancer, but it's not uh, exactly the same. On this slide, I show you um, that uh, the today the worst prognosis in metastatic breast cancer is that of triple negative breast cancer, um, shown in the um, uh, red line, and that the HER2 positive uh, uh, one, oh, this is an older um, version uh, showing that the HER2 positive one was also a, a highly aggressive tumor. Now, uh, this is a, this uh, triple negative breast cancer has a somewhat different um, 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 epidemiology. It is present twice as frequently in women of African ancestry, especially in premenopausal women of African ancestry, which perhaps uh, explains some of the inferior survival of these women based on population based uh, uh, data. Now, uh, triple negative breast cancer, as has been mentioned earlier today, is a heterogeneous disease, as is anything defined by a negative uh, uh, prefix, like non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, so it is, of, it is no surprise that, that if you look at triple negative breast cancer, you find all uh, um, uh, molecular subtypes of breast cancer represented, although about three quarters represent uh, the basal type breast cancer. Now there's a subtype of triple negative breast cancer characterized by low claudine expression, and that represents about almost a third of triple negative breast cancers. And if you carve that one out, then triple negative breast cancer um, uh, only about half of triple negative breast cancer is basaloid, and the rest is divided between the various other molecular subtypes. Now, um, <coughs> this, uh, these pie uh, charts show you the various clinical molecular subtypes compared to basal-like clotting law and uh, the other uh, molecular subtypes defined by gene expression profiling. And this shows you how uh, there is lack of complete overlap in these classifications and how carefully one needs to assess and use this terminology and not to mix the clinical terminology and the molecular subtypes. Now, the basal-like subtype represents about uh, 10 to 20 percent of breast cancers. Um, the majority are triple negative. Uh, they have a distinct cell type of origin, uh, which is why they are called basal-like. 
Uh, about 50% have a P53 mutation. Uh, they have a high proliferative rate and RB loss. Um, uh, they have a high expression of EGFR. Uh, most of the BRCA1, not BRCA2, but most of the BRCA1 mutated breast cancers are part of the basal-like subtype, um, and their prognosis is poor, uh, although they respond with great frequency to chemotherapy, at least uh, transiently. So the therapeutic questions in this group that are being explored today is whether platinum salts or other DNA active agents are more active than other therapeutic agents used today, whether the PARP uh, inhibitors benefit non-BRCA mutated uh, triple negative breast cancers, and whether other agents such as angiogenesis inhibitors or EGFR inhibitors are useful for their treatment. The Claudian subtype has somewhat different characteristics with uh, lymphocytic infiltrates, uh, stem cell and EMT features, um, but they share with other uh, triple negative breast cancers or basaloid breast cancers a poor prognosis and um, a relatively poor uh, response to therapy. Uh, there are also a number of therapeutic questions in this subtype. Now, um, it has been mentioned several times today how, while it is important to characterize the tumor cell itself. The stroma has critical importance in our assessment of risk and our assessment of sensitivity to therapy. This is a, a, a study we did in, in, in our lab looking at uh, something that came naturally by the difference in what you get through a fine needle aspirate and the core biopsy. A fine needle aspiration is almost 100% tumor cells. A core biopsy has a substantial proportion of stromal cells. So when you characterize a material that comes from these two different sources, you actually get in one of them, in the core biopsy specimens, a substantial influence of tumor stroma that does not appear in fine needle aspirates. And we find that, that there is a substantial presence of immune um, um, uh, genes, uh, including especially the B-cell type or B-cell related genes, uh, and that the presence or the expression of these genes result in different uh, prognosis of breast cancer. And that is shown on the right side of this slide. And if you look at uh, the various genes that appear, or metagenes that appear in this experiment, the IL-8 and the B-cell metagenes are significantly associated with the outcome of breast cancer. Uh, this has actually come up in a variety, from a variety of sources, looking at molecular characterization of breast cancer, and I would be surprised if it was not true in other solid tumors. So I think we need to uh, not forget that the stroma has a critical importance in the prognosis of this disease and perhaps in the choice of optimal therapy. Now, this is a, a close-up of, uh, of, of a different um, uh, article, but also showing the same thing. This is in triple negative and basal-like breast cancer, uh, looking at B-cell high and IL-8 low. Um, um, uh, expressing uh, cell types versus the rest uh, and showing a, a highly significant difference in the outcome of these uh, of breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, divided by uh, the expression of these immune uh, genes. Now, triple negative breast cancer has multiple potential therapeutic targets, including EGFR, uh, MET, I didn't show you data about that, but it is true. Um, angiogenesis, pro-angiogenic factors, uh, PARP, um, and a variety of other uh, DNA repair pathways. Um, today, we treat triple negative breast cancers with chemotherapy, chemotherapy, and more chemotherapy. And the therapeutic choices are few, and most of them are quite toxic. There is some activity of bevacizumab uh, in this group, no 
greater than that in the other subtypes of breast cancer, but bevacizumab combinations do result in higher response rate in some prolongation in progression-free survival. Now, potential new agents for triple negative breast cancer. Of course, there's much interest in the platinum salt for reasons that were eloquently uh, displayed by one of the previous speakers. Epidermal growth factor uh, receptor inhibitors um, and a variety of other um, targeted uh, therapies such as uh, CHK1 inhibitors, ATM inhibitors, uh, etc. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, Dr. Kennedy did a super job in explaining the, the part about um, um, synthetic lethality. Uh, so suffice it to say that if you have a pre-existing uh, lesion in DNA repair and you complement that by inhibition of the complementary DNA repair mechanism, you actually kill the cell. And this is the principle behind PARP inhibitors, and I'm sure it is the principle behind a number of other potential combinations one could develop and use. PARP inhibitors had a, a huge explosion of enthusiasm with the initial Iniparib phase two study. As you heard earlier today, unfortunately, the phase three study failed to, to conf uh, confirm uh, that level of enthusiasm, although there is clearly some activity of this agent in the phase three study. There, it prompted a number of studies of the mechanism of action of uh, Iniparib, since it appears to be a poor PARP inhibitor, but it does have anti-tumor efficacy. Other PARP inhibitors seem to be of greater efficacy, but unfortunately, the market appears to be very small. Uh, at this time, restricted to the BRCA mutated subtype, so that represents about 5% of breast cancers. And I think some of the sponsors have become shy in continued development of these agents. So to conclude about the TNBC, triple negative breast cancer, this is a heterogeneous disease or group of diseases that show a poor prognosis. Um, it is composed predominantly of basal-like and clotting low subtypes, but there are other smaller subtypes included in the TNBC group and that there are a number of promising, at least theoretically promising, therapeutic targets that we need to study and develop. Now, I want to follow up on the concept of heterogeneity with which I started, because if you do sequencing uh, of breast cancers, this is a group of 271 breast cancers we sequenced in my group, um, you see that there is enormous heterogeneity and almost every breast cancer is a one-off. Now, uh, at first blush, that would seem um, not only disappointing, but terribly frustrating, because how do you systematize treatment based on total heterogeneity? But you can actually cluster these into, into uh, subgroups that make sense and where they share potential therapeutic targets. So each of, uh, each of these uh, horizontal lines is a gene, each of the vertical lines is a tumor, and you can see that there are multiple uh, mutations identified in at least an important subset of breast cancers, and that the number of mutations varies, um, but uh, it, it can be measured in the dozens, certainly. Now, we have also done uh, a lot of work with systems biology, trying to integrate data developed from uh, transcriptional profiling, um, uh, mi uh, so microarray data, uh, protein interactions and transcription, and trying to bring this into, into uh, a system to understand what, um, does, what do these changes represent functionally. And, uh, and it's very interesting. So these are two databases, um, one from Chin, one from uh, Andre, which is from, uh, who's from the Gustave Roussy, that show that you can actually identify the dominant um, molecular lesions that are the drivers of these various subtypes of breast cancer. And notice how dominant HER2 amplification is. There is virtually no competition for it, and the other um, nodes in the signaling pathway of HER2 are just part of the HER2 signaling network. Whereas in ER-positive and triple-negative breast cancer, there is much more um, 
heterogeneity on how the various signaling pathways that seem to dominate tumor growth and proliferation interact. And I think this type of analysis requires very complex and sophisticated uh, informatics. And uh, as mentioned earlier uh, by Peter, I think it is critically important for us to develop that. Uh, just laboratory experiments are not going to do it. Clinical trials are not going to do it. We need to understand this very clearly. So what do we do with these results? Well, certainly it uh, shows the path for us to understand the biology of these various genes that appear repeatedly in, uh, in various experiments to a greater detail. And then it helps us formulate novel therapeutic hypotheses. For instance, what does uh, ALK mutations in 2% of breast cancer mean? You know, I think uh, it is a, a, a challenge for drug development, but it, it is something that we will have to uh, approach very carefully. Also looking at <coughs> excuse me, primary breast cancers uh, by sequencing, we have identified a number of mutations that are infrequent but not rare. So I show you here um, AKT, ALK, BRAF, CDK4, EGFR, FGFR2, uh, KIT, KRAS, etc. Uh, whether these are functionally important and relevant to breast cancer, I do not know. But these are clearly present. And uh, what that indicates to us is that in addition to the obvious, like HER2 and ER and uh, PI3 kinase, there are a number of mutations that are present in breast cancer in small numbers, but small numbers in breast cancer represent perhaps tens of thousands of patients, certainly more around the world. And they represent a therapeutic challenge, but the ones I have listed here have uh, therapeutic agents that uh, um, uh, target that specific molecular abnormality and that are in clinical development, and we need to take advantage of that. So I think this will change the face of uh, uh, drug development. It will change the face of how we screen for uh, biomarkers, because obviously it's not practical or economically feasible to um, screen 100 women so as to identify two that have an ALK mutation. So we will need to screen for multiple abnormalities so as to identify the various pathways that might be relevant and uh, uh, technologically important. So this is the clear road to the future. Um, <clears throat> if you follow these instructions, I think you will find exactly how you should treat your patients and how you should develop drugs. And I shall not belabor this. Uh, this slide actually uh, I got uh, courtesy of Roy Herbs, who, whom you will have uh, tomorrow on this podium. But it uh, um, personalized targeted therapy obviously represents important challenges in the development of biomarkers. Biomarkers without the development of molecular diagnostics, personalized therapy does not exist. So I think that is critically important, and I. I congratulate our um, colleagues from the UK who have uh, um, taken the bull by the horns and decided to invest in that. But the pieces of the puzzle are starting to fall in place, and while it will take us a, a number of years to actually complete this transformation, uh, we are uh, in an, an, an unchangeable path where personalized cancer therapy is going to happen. It is just a question of when. <clears throat> how much it will going to cost, and uh, um, uh, how strongly we feel about uh, developing it as soon as possible. So we will need some luck in the process that always helps. <clears throat> and uh, I would like to conclude here by saying that breast cancer is clearly a conglomerate of mo multiple molecularly defined syndromes that happen to start in the same organ, perhaps not on the same cell, that today we have a few clinical biomarkers that are critical for optimal practice of medicine, uh, on oncology in this setting, uh, that we, have, uh, we are in the process of developing multiple molecular diagnostics that will facilitate the path of molecular uh, treatment, and that we have started to take the first steps in that direction. 
And I would encourage all of us to continue to interact because this is going to be critically important. Um, I would also like to encourage us not to get lost in single genes or single proteins. That's not where the future is. I think combinations of uh, the results of various high throughput uh, uh, tests are critical. Uh, we are clearly in the two drug and three drug uh, combination era um, because single targeted therapies are just not going to do it for the great majority of patients. That will also require uh, increased collaboration from our sponsors. Uh, and of course, it represents some challenges in intellectual property and patents and all of that. These are some of the people who are responsible for most of the data I have shown you. We have developed over the years a very large international collaborative network with, and I'm indebted to them for ideas, concepts, uh, tumor material, etc. And of course, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the young lady who's covering her face. <coughs> But over the last 33 years, she has been uh, my support, my strength. Thank you.